Thank you, Mingan, and uh, uh, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, and uh, so I have been asked to talk about uh, the effect of feed stress on feed digestibility. And uh, the scene has been already set by the previous speakers uh, uh, about heat stress, but uh, I will just add a few points which I think is relevant. Uh, when you talk about, it's, it's true, you know, as mentioned by the previous speakers, when you talk about heat stress, we think about uh, temperature, high temperature, which is not the case. Actually, there are so many confronting issues. So I will also brief, briefly spend some time talking about some of these interacting factors. Uh, then, of course, of course, I will review the literature, which is available on feed digestibility, which is uh, very limited as well as conflicting, contradictory data. So we'll try to make some sense out of uh, what is available in the literature. And finally, I will talk about what we know about uh, heat stress and what we don't know about heat stress and what is missing, the knowns and unknowns. Uh, what you see here, for most part, the current genetic lines have been developed and bred in temperate climates. And whereas to most of uh, today's poultry, as pointed out earlier, is concentrated in the uh, tropical Uh, in the tropical and subtropical regions. Uh, in fact, uh, the prediction is uh, during the next decade, 85% uh, of the uh, poultry growth is going to take place in these regions, which is uh, Asia, which includes Asia, Africa, and South America, with Asia leading the way, most of the uh, growth in the next 10 years. During the next 50 years, it's going to be totally different. Africa is going to come up on top. Uh, so the question is, uh, the poultry is concentrated in the tropical climate, and how applicable uh, are the nutritional data which have been recommended by breeding companies based on the work which is done in uh, thermoneutral conditions? So this is a challenge for us. This is one of the questions which will be discussed during the um, proceedings today. And. Uh, the, the term heat stress uh, has different meanings in different parts of the world. Uh, in the tropics, uh, typically we find uh, high, higher temperatures, ambient temperature experienced uh, uh, over a prolonged period of time. Uh, and in fact, a temperature of 30 degrees is not considered unduly oppressive in a tropical country, uh, such as ba Bangkok, 30 degrees is normal. Whereas uh, you go to the temperate climate where we don't see chronic uh, uh, heat stress, whereas what we see is acute heat stress, short spells of uh, high temperatures during the summer months. So th th these are two different meanings. We need to consider both these. Sorry. And uh, uh, what happens is uh, the heat stress, uh, when you look at the, um, so poultry, like all the, all the animals actually experience uh, heat, uh, uh, heat stress, um, when the temperature, ambient temperature goes beyond a certain uh, critical level. And uh, the, this particular upper critical temperature uh, it's about 35 degrees at the time of hatch and decreases to about 24 or so around uh, after about three, week, three or four weeks. Uh, so the point I'm making is uh, heat stress becomes important, become, becomes a concern only after a certain period of time, about three weeks of age. But I'm going to revise this after listening to Dr. Ferry. Uh, so the heat stress become only an issue when you go beyond 1.5 kilos. I think it's better to be talk about the body weight, given the fact that the uh, modern, modern broilers are growing faster and faster. We are reaching the 1.5 bit earlier than previous year, and uh, 1.5 seems to be a, 
very good number during which time the heat stress become a real practical concern. Before that, we don't have to worry much about the effect is only uh, minor. And uh, as you know, at the heat stress progresses, there are a number of changes in the bird. Uh, uh, some are behavioral and physiological, hormonal, uh, and metabolic. Uh, with uh, negative effects on bird performance, uh, intestine, and nutrient utilization. So the last one is the one I'm going to talk about. And uh, the most recognizable, this has been dis discussed earlier, the most recognizable uh, effect of heat stress is on feed intake, reduction of feed intake. But again, as pointed out by others, uh, the, the reduction what you see in growth or egg production is greater, much greater than uh, what you see in the feed uh, feed reduction, and uh, essentially it tells us there are something else is going on. Not feed intake is a problem, but there are also some some other uh, related, unrelated, totally unrelated factors are uh, playing a role. The subject of uh, heat stress is quite complex, in fact, highly complex, and uh, uh, quite complicated. And these are some of the factors which are actually complicating our understanding of uh, heat stress. Uh, just to, these are some of the major ones. Just to point out some, uh, there is uh, different types of heat stress. The most important one is acute uh, versus uh, chronic uh, heat stress. And there is also could be cyclical and continuous heat stress. And uh, then we, we are talking about relative humidity, highlighted by Ferry uh, in his talk. And uh, then the acclimation. Can the birds get acclimated uh, to heat stress, continuous heat stress? And uh, the issue of body weight, as well as genetics, and uh, the timing, duration, and severity of the particular uh, high temperature. So all these are, so this is something, uh, especially when, if you go through the literature, what you'll find is very quickly we realize there is, you cannot actually make a good comparison between different sets of data because so all are done under external conditions in a different ways. Just want to talk about two of these issues, confounding issues, uh, the acute versus chronic heat stress. And uh, so, there are a number of things which happens in the uh, protein digestion and metabolism uh, when the birds undergoes uh, heat stress. And uh, so these are different events. Uh, and uh, so we start with protein digestion, protein synthesis, protein deposition, protein breakdown, and nitrogen retention, the protein retention as such. Uh, all these are affected by heat stress. I just put a question mark for protein digestion because uh, we are going to talk about it a bit later. Uh, poss possibly there are effects, but th at this point we will keep it a question mark. And protein, and uh, there is very little difference, uh, at least looking at the literature, between the acute versus chronic uh, heat stress. Uh, in both cases, we see protein synthesis is reduced, um, protein deposition is reduced, and uh, uh, plasma-free amino acids are depleted, especially so in the case of uh, sulfur amino acids and uh, branch-chain amino acids. So that has some meaning uh, in terms of amino acid nutrition. Uh, then, of course, uh, there's a big reduction in the nitrogen uh, redu uh, efficiency. And there's a slight difference between these two uh, in terms of uh, protein breakdown. In the case of acute when there's a short spell of high temperature, we see quite a rapid increase in uh, protein breakdown. Uh, whereas in the case of uh, uh, chronic shortages, there seems to be some sort of acclimation. It sort of reduces uh, as the time uh, goes on. And of course, this uh, issue raised, and uh, we say 
So in a tropical climate, not only tropical, any, any, any part of the world, we see a range of uh, relative humidities uh, uh, with high temperatures. It could be very low or it could be fully saturated uh, as we see, typically see in uh, some of the tropical areas. So the important point is, as pointed out earlier, the relative humidity will intensify uh, or modify responses. So the birds or any animal can actually uh, withstand uh, high temperatures at a low relative humidity and vice versa. Uh, just uh, we'll go through the published data on feed digestibility and uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, is both limited as and contradictory. And, uh, and also very limited data. We have only two reports published uh, on feed digestibility. There are four on amino acid digestibility and about seven on AME. Uh, before talking about uh, digestibility, I just want to make a comment on the terminology used to measure uh, digestibility, total tract digestibility versus ileal digestibility. So the strengths and limitations of each, each of these uh, terminologies have been debated for over many, many years. Uh, but I'm not going to go through any of these. Uh, what I want to point out is uh, prior to 1990s, the total tract digestibility was widely used. But uh, currently, uh, the preferred method of uh, digestibility evaluation is ileal digestibility, mainly because of the fact uh, the ileal digestibility overcomes the, uh, hind, uh, the effect of uh, hindgut microbes, uh, especially in terms of the, some of the mic macronutrients, uh, starch and protein. And also it avoids the, any contamination from urine, and especially for minerals. Uh, all right, and this is uh, the first of the uh, study conducted in, uh, or published in 1997, and you see the name of very famous French scientists, and uh, uh, in which uh, the effect of high ambient temperature on feed digestibility was looked at. Uh, this was done in just brief uh, description of the trial. Uh, four week old broilers and c constant temperatures for two weeks, either 22 or 32 degrees. Uh, but there were three treatments, uh, uh, that is uh, ad libitum feeding, 22 degrees, uh, ad libitum feeding, 32 degrees. Uh, and we had a, they had a third grow, uh, which was pair fed based on the daily feed intake of the uh, 32 degree birds. And total tract digestibility was measured. And this, these are the results, and which clearly indicates so we have the 22 ad libitum, 32 ad libitum, and 22 uh, pair fed. And uh, as you can see, the body weight gain was, uh, uh, or the feed intake was reduced by, uh, body weight gain was almost half. 50, it was reduced by 50, 50, around 50%, whereas the uh, feed intake reduction was only around uh, 30, 35%, I would think. And so again, it highlights the feed intake is not totally responsible for the loss of weight gain we see in heat stress birds. Uh, looking at the digestibility, the digestibility was uh, uh, decreased at high temperatures at 32 degrees. Uh, the decreases are not anything dramatic, but except for a couple of uh, uh, the mineral uh, digestibility and uh, protein digestibility. Uh, certainly we see there's a big drop in nitrogen retention. And if you compare what is happening in the, with the pair of at 22 degrees, uh, and uh, you can see uh, the diameter, uh, sorry, the uh, nutrient digestibility, feed digestibility was not influenced. Uh, this uh, a second paper on heat stress uh, coming from Brazil and uh, slightly different approach and three week old male broilers. The treatments were imposed uh, from three to six weeks of age, two treatments, 22 degrees and 32 degrees. 
and again digestibility was measured, total tract digestibility in this case again. Uh, and uh, these are the results. Again, you see the same, sorry. Again, you see the same uh, effect about uh, body weight gain was uh, reduced by about 35%, but the feed intake was reduced only around 25% or so. Uh, so the feed intake does not explain all the performance uh, reductions we are see in the heat stress conditions. Uh, in this particular uh, study, there was no effect of temperature, uh, chronic uh, temperature on uh, feed digestibility, pro uh, digestibility of protein and fat. But you can see what is happening here in terms of retention of nutrients. So it is telling us there is something happening very drastically, dramatically after the absorption. So maybe there is an effect of, on the digestion, minor effect, but uh, something big is happening once the nutrients are absorbed. And published data on amino acid digestibility. Uh, briefly, I'm going to go. The first report comes from the University of Sydney, uh, 1984, quite a long time back, and where they looked at the effect of temperature, age, as well as sex, the gender on digestibility amino acids. And the, so this is a brief summary of the results they found. And uh, these are the amino acids which were uh, affected, influenced by the uh, temperature. And uh, there was, uh, and you can see there are a number of amino acids uh, which are uh, given a superscript star, and uh, they were, they also uh, uh, sex into temperature interaction. And what is happening at the high temperature, the females were affected more than the females. So there was a very clear gender sex effect, and there was no effect between uh, 30 days and uh, 50 days. And uh, so, and this is second study coming from the, uh, again, the, this is from France, and uh, where they looked at the effect of ambient temperature on digestibility of uh, two different ingredients, uh, soybean meal and the rapeseed meal. And, uh, uh, so, again, they had male and female uh, broilers, 22 degrees versus 32 degrees, and the uh, treatments are imposed from uh, four to six weeks. And uh, again, this was a total track uh, collection and total track uh, digestibility. And uh, what they found is the, the effects seemed to be ingredient dependent. There was no effect on soybean meal but there were significant effects in the case of uh, uh, rapeseed meal. And just, just like the units of Sydney study, they also found the females were more sensitive to uh, high temperature effects. 12% uh, uh, reduction was seen in females as against uh, only 3% in the males. And uh, this is coming from Iran. Again, they have looked at the uh, temperature into sex interaction. Uh, I'll just uh, give a summary of the results. And uh, so there are three treatments, uh, 21 degrees 30, and 35 degrees for three hours a day. It's an acute sort of heat, heat stress. And, uh, and also, which was given every day for one week whereas the third treatment was given every day, three hours of heat, <coughs> high temperatures for uh, two more, two weeks. And what is clear is the uh, acute uh, heat stress also had an effect on, that is three hours per day also had an effect on uh, amino acid digestibility, uh, which was significantly decreased as you can see uh, in this trial. And giving more time to acclimate uh, did not really have an effect. Uh, in this particular study, there was no difference between uh, males and females. And the study, uh, with, this was in laying hands, 
um, they had th three treatments, a constant 21 degrees, a cyclic temperature of 35 degrees for 12 hours and uh, 29 degrees for another 12 hours. So, and the third treatment was uh, 35 degrees for 12 hours and 21 degrees for uh, another 12 hours. Anyway, the summary of this is think there was no uh, difference in the total tract digestibility uh, of any of the amino acids. It, heat exposure and AME, there are seven reports uh, which are available against CC. Uh, it's, it's just all over the place. Uh, uh, essentially, there are four reports telling us there's no change effect on AME, and there are two uh, recording decreases in AME at high temperature, and there was one report which actually says the AME was uh, increased. So it, it's quite uh, contradictory data, just like in here. And just um, talk about minerals. In one of the earlier studies, we found we we saw that uh, mineral digestibility was uh, decreased, and uh, here again. Uh, we don't usually look into this, but again, it uh, tells us uh, it, minerals are also affected, in fact, very severely affected. Uh, in this particular study, what they did was they, they used cholestomized birds where you are able to collect the urine and the uh, excreta separately. And what they found was there was no effect on the mineral output in the form of excreta but they have a major effect in urine output as well as uh, the urine mineral content. Uh, and both were increased at high temperatures. And you can see the numbers, what they are reporting, and uh, quite significant differences. And the effects were quite significant for calcium, phosphorus, uh, sodium, and potassium, and also magnesium. So what do we make sense of all this data? At least I'm going by the external data. And uh, it's very difficult to make any link between the, this information, what we have in the published data, and the, in a very uh, truly quantitative matter. We can only assume and guess few things. Uh, as I'm, Despite this inconclusive evidence, what I'm saying is nutrient digestibility is certainly, from what you know, based on the effect of high temperatures on uh, intestine, I think there is nutrient digestibility will be affected by heat stress. But the reductions are minor compared to what you see in nutrient utilization. What happens after the absorption? What happens after the absorption, the post-absorptive metabolism of nutrients is more dramatically affected by uh, high temperatures. I like this uh, particular uh, quote, which, was, which is from a very famous person. And uh, there are known knowns. There are known unknowns. Typically fits in very well with a uh, lot of scientific issues, uh, including heat stress. And then, of course, there are unknown unknowns. We will not talk about unknown unknowns because we don't know what they are. Uh, and, but we, we know what is known, uh, what happens in the heat stress, the performance affected, and the feed intake is reduced, and the feed intake does not explain everything. And then, of course, there are known unknowns. We know a lot of things are happening at the intestine level, as you can see. All these things which have been discussed previously by the previous speakers, uh, intestinal integrity is number one. There's leakage of the gut. There is quite a f big issues there. And you can just see w what exactly is happening. There are some, some uh, there's also uh, endogenous amino acid losses are increased. There's decreased blood flow to the gut. Uh, gene expression is affected, amino acid uh, transport is affected, inflammation of intestinal uh, intestine is increased, and also there is change. Uh, so 
some of these, how they interact with each other and how they, but certainly we know that uh, intestine is affected during uh, uh, heat stress. And uh, I think it's a very important issue, especially given the fact that antibiotics are banned, or it's banned in most countries. Uh, some of these issues, the issues of the intestine is coming to the forefront. It will be a serious concern in the future uh, when you lose the use of uh, antibiotics. So, in almost towards the conclusion, the current knowledge and protein metabolism has been obtained under thermoneutral condition. So, what does it mean? Do we have to come up with the different values for amino acid digestibility? I don't think so. Maybe in the future, maybe we can do a correction if that's important. But like I said, digestibility effect is minor compared to what is happening after the absorption. And so that will impact on amino acid requirement. This is unknown. Ideal amino acid balance, I, would, I think it will be affected, especially in terms of threonine, because given the importance of threonine uh, in the intestinal health, and uh, certainly there's some evidence that sulfur amino acids are maybe we have to consider slightly higher ratios, uh, et cetera. Anyway, uh, as a conclusion, I just referred to something which was said in 1998. Uh, better knowledge of the effects of heat exposure overall on amino acid uh, metabolism is first necessary. I agree. And unfortunately, in the last 20 years, we are not moved. Still, we are saying the same thing. Maybe in the next 20 years, maybe there's some answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi. That was um, a very important message, I think. Now we should get uh, some questions, I suppose. Oh, th this is a, a very, the first one is interesting, I think, uh, because you, uh, you, report, you mentioned uh, a number of literature reports that were looking at acute heat stress versus chronic heat stress, and there are definitely differences. Eh? And uh, so um, could you comment on the, uh, uh, you know, the limiting temperature for acute versus chronic heat stress for layers and broilers? depending on production stage because right. you know there's yeah. a uh, you know there's some hints being given in the literature on that probably again when you look at the literature the picture is not very clear but what i can tell you what i did was you know i reviewed what has been done in the literature and uh, for example um, acute temperature ac acute heat stress there is there was one report where actually 35 degrees for 15 minutes had a very bad negative impact on, uh, you know, the performance, uh, the uh, digestibility, not digestibility, but uh, the overall performance of the bird. Uh, so it's just one report. And uh, I think we are talking about body weight here. It depends on the body weight. And uh, of course, as the bird puts on, you know, puts on more body, body weight, the heat production increases, and then even a small increase is going to uh, have a big effect. So I think the, that will be very yeah, difficult to, <laughs> yeah. Then there's um, the high fiber ingredients. Yeah. That's an interesting one as well, I think. Uh, very good question, yeah. Uh, I think there will be, that's a, in my opinion, if you are feeding corn soy, soy diets, I don't think we are going to see big difference between uh, thermoneutral and heat stress conditions uh, because that's when I look at the numbers which are coming from uh, tropical countries uh, for corn soy diets, which is around 85, that's normal range. Uh, but uh, we don't know what will happen uh, when you, as you increase your byproduct level. I would expect that's going to be different between uh, thermoneutral condition, but I, I have no uh, supporting data at all. Yeah. And and, and maybe um, we should also address the um, the question about the phytase and you know the as you as you mentioned this uh, this huge drop in phosphorus retention. 
Do you think we should do go into that direction? Uh, this essentially will seem to indicate the phosphorus retention is affected, and uh, that's just one study, which, which certainly highlights there's an issue with mineral retention. Okay, but I don't know whether we should re revise uh, the five test recommendations. Uh, I think we have to go back to the companies involved and sort of talk to them about it. And uh, but when you look at the data in t coming from tropical countries uh, with the use of phytase, bone ash, and all these, they seem to be working all right. At least, uh, but again, these are some of the unknowns. We don't know. Yeah, so uh, I think as we are running short of time, okay. we'll, I'm afraid we'll have to keep the questions for later. Yes. Thank you very much, Ravi. Thank you for this interesting talk.